Welcome to the Life United Podcast. We are all about helping you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. We know that today's message is going to be a blessing to you. I've got a word uh, for you tonight. Pastor will be back, uh, be speaking this Sunday in both the 9 and 10.45, and he'll be uh, next uh, Wednesday as well. And so it's going to be great, but he's given me the privilege uh, to share tonight. And I want to talk with you about being in the middle. The, the, the name of the message is actually Meet Me in the Middle. And one of the things that I want to point out is that there can be challenges in the middle. How many know what I'm talking about when I say challenges in the middle? If you don't, I'll tell you. There are times that you can find yourself or we can find ourselves in difficult places, kind of between a rock and a hard place, and in a place where we just need God to move. We need God to do something. If God doesn't pull something off, <laughs> we're in trouble. I remember uh, several, several years ago now, it's, uh, gosh, it was in October of 2006. October in 2006, we were living out west. We were living in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, while living out there, uh, I did a lot of hunting or as much as I could. We were pastoring, but I did as much as I could. And, and so one morning I was out uh, with my bow and arrow. That's pretty much what I hunted with and still hunt with today is, is my bow and my arrow. And so I was out and, and just enjoying a great morning. And I had to be back in town, back in the office by early afternoon. So I was just going to get a quick hunt in that morning and head back. So I finished up my hunting, actually was hiking out and hiking up the mountain to get to where my truck was at. And so I just stopped in some trees for a few moments and just kind of standing there, kind of hanging out, just enjoying the moment, really. And uh, looking up the mountain through the trees, and I, I saw what I thought was a coyote actually running through the trees, not at me, but sort of close to me. And so, uh, so I, I just stopped, and I'm thinking, oh, it's probably a coyote. I get to see, you know, a coyote. And I went ahead and got an arrow out and put in and got in place just in case. And so as I got my arrow in place, I looked again, I realized, wait, this is not a coyote because behind the first little creature, I saw another little creature. He was black. I realized <laughs> there are two black bear cubs. They're two-year-old black bear cubs, and they're running. Again, the, the, the brown one, the one in front, was not necessarily running at me. Actually, it kind of turned and went in an angle. I'm not moving. I'm just standing there because one of the things that I began to think about when I saw these cubs was, where is the mama? <laughs> because mama should be with them. And so the, 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 the lighter color one turned and went to my right a little bit. But the, 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 the black one, the little black one, he, he just kept running. I'm frozen. I'm just standing still, just watching everything. And so he runs towards me. I mean, like almost hit me. I, he runs right by my left side. So all of this is happening. Just a few seconds have, have, uh, have, have gone by, and I'm watching all this happening in my back of my mind. And I actually, it wasn't the back of my mind. It was in the front of my mind. I was thinking, where is Mama? Because these two bears have ran by me, and then I look back up, and guess who I see? It's Mama. So I found myself. I realized that I was not in a good spot. I was in the middle. I was between a Mama bear and her cubs. That's not a good place to be. And so uh, I see the bear running, and I realize that she still, she still doesn't see me. She's running on the same path as the, her second cub, so she's coming right at me. And so she's probably, you know, 50 yards out, something like that. I'm still standing there. Let me remind you, I've got a bow and arrow, right? And I'm standing there. She doesn't see me, but I'm thinking because I'd seen several bears in the wild there, black bears in the wild while living there. And what do you do? You just holler at them to let them know that you're a human and the way that's supposed to work is when you holler at them, they're supposed to run the other way. So I decided, well, I'll just holler at her. And so I hollered at the mama bear running towards me. <laughs> and you, you, you may be thinking, was it something spiritual, Pastor John? No, it was probably not real spiritual. It was like, hey, it probably sounded like a girl. I don't know. But I just hollered at this bear and guess what happened? She started running faster at me. And so as she's running at me, I realized there's no way to, where for me to go. If I run, there's no way that I could outrun her. So she's coming at me by this moment. She's probably about three or four yards from me. I released the arrow, and as I've drawn it back, I've released the arrow. Thankfully, the arrow hit her in a place that turned her. It wasn't a mortal wound, but it turned her. She took off running uh, the other way, and guess which direction I ran? I ran the opposite way. 
And, and it was that moment that, uh, that uh, the adrenaline was pumping, and, and I'd realize, you know what, God has helped me. God has delivered me. God has been there for, he was there for me because I was in the middle and it was a difficult place. You know, there are times that it gets messy in the middle. And to, to, to finish the rest of the story, the game warden and wildlife biologist came in. They did uh, an investigation. They realized, we figured that she was still going to make it. And, and so I guess the mama bear is still living and I'm still living. So it's all good. My point is this, there are times in the middle, there are times in the middle, it can get messy. There are times in the middle it can get difficult the disciples knew about this there was a day that uh, Jesus had finished preaching a message and after he got through preaching the message he sent the disciples away it's in Mark chapter 6 verse 47 the Jesus hung out and hung, he hung back and he sent the uh, people away the crowd away but before that he told the disciples he said here's what I want you to do I want you to go and get in the boat I want you to go to the other side of the sea he said I'll catch up with you later so they went away and they went on their, on their way and Jesus went away and he was sending off the, uh, the, all the crowd of people. And then the Bible says that it, was, it, was, uh, it got a little bit dark or a, little, a lot dark. Jesus was praying. He looked and he said, the, the Bible says that the disciples were in the middle of the sea. In Mark chapter 6 verse 47, it says, later that night the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. I'm not going to read the rest of it, but I can tell you what happened. What happened was this, is that the disciples were rowing. They were in the middle of the sea, but they had a problem. And the problem was the wind was hitting them. There was a storm and they were giving it all they had. Where were they? Right out in the <laughs> middle. And so they're giving it all that they've got and they're not going anywhere. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you are trying the hardest that you, that, that you can possibly try? You're working as hard as you can. You're using your faith and you're being as strong as you can spiritually, but it just doesn't seem like you're making any progress. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there now, but it's kind of in that middle place where th there's resistance and it's very very challenging so so they're out there rowing and the bible said after a bit jesus starts walking out there towards them yes he's walking on the water and i love what how mark describes it it says it said that 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 jesus was walking by them <laughs> can you just the Bible is hilarious to me at times. And just, just get this in your mind. So, so you're in the boat, you're disciples, and you are working as hard as you can. And then you look to the side, and there is Jesus just walking by you like, hey, <laughs> what's up? <sighs> Could you just imagine that? You're thinking, well, this is what they did. They began to cry out in terror. They were scared because they weren't sure who it was. He calmed them. And he said, hey, it's me. It's Jesus. And then look what happened in verse 51. It says, then he, Jesus, climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed. You know, again, it can get messy in the middle. It can get hard in the middle. It can be difficult in the middle. But <laughs> you can be in the middle, and Jesus get in your boat, and things can get better. Let me just say it this way. Things will get better when Jesus is in your boat. Hey, maybe you're watching this, uh, this evening, and you're, you're, uh, you're on Facebook, and you're in the chat. Just, just type in there right now, Jesus is in my boat. <laughs> just put that in there. Jesus is in my boat. And you know what? Everything's going to be okay, even though it may get a little messy. It may get a little hard. When Jesus is with you in the middle, it's going to get better. Let me, let me remind you or give you another moment in the middle. It was a very familiar verse of scripture. This is probably one of my favorite events in the Bible. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's when David fought Goliath. I, I just love this story. I love this event. I love this truth. Let me set it up for you. Uh, we had uh, on one uh, ridge, if you will, or one side of a valley, you had God's chosen people. You had the army of Israel. In the middle, you had a valley, and then on the other side, you had uh, some uh, long-standing uh, enemies of God's people. They were the Philistines. And the Scripture says that for 40 days, 40 days, twice a day, Goliath, the, the best that the Philistines had, he was a great warrior. He was a giant of a man. He would go out into the middle. He would step out into the middle between his army and God's army, and he would make threats, and he would make, uh, make a scene, and he would say all sorts of bad things about God's people, and he would give them an invitation. Hey, you just send one person to come and fight, and whoever wins, it's a winner-take-all event. Well, this went on for 40 days, but there was something that happened on day 41 that shifted. It was something that happened. 
It was pretty amazing because it was on day 41, it it was on day 41 that, that David stepped out into the middle. He came into the camp of God's army. He was standing there. He heard what was happening. And you know what? He went to the middle. And look how it turned out in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 15. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. And it all went down in the middle. Do you know some of your greatest victories that you'll ever experience is in the middle? Some of your greatest battles you'll ever experience is in the middle. It's there, it's in the middle. But you know what? That almost didn't happen. David was on his way from the army to the middle to take on Goliath. And and it almost didn't happen because there was something that got in his way. There was something that took place on the way to his middle. This is what happened on the way to the middle. Listen to what happened. 1 Samuel 17 verse 28 says, His older brother Eliab heard what he had said because, I mean, excuse me, David had said, I'll go fight Goliath. I volunteer, I'll do it. His oldest brother Eliab heard what he had said to the men. And well, listen to this part. And he became very angry with David. He became very what? Angry with David and said, Why have you come here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the desert? I know your pride and the sin of your heart. You've come here to see the battle again. There was anger that had taken place. It was anger in Eliab's heart. There was anger that was spewing out of his mouth. And I'm dedicating the rest of this sermon, the rest of this message to that exact point. The subject of anger. Because David was on the way. Eliab was, 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 was uh, angry. But I want you to look at what David did. 1 Samuel 17 verse 30. It says, then David, watch this, then David turned away from him. So he hears what Eliab said. Eliab's angry. Eliab's upset. He listens to what he said. But pay close attention. This is very, very good. David turned away from him. <laughs> Why? Why did, anger, why did David turn away, away from him? And, and, and here, here's the reason why. It's our first point. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. Anger will distract. Anger will distract you. Remember, David is going to the middle. He's getting ready to fight the battle. David is going there. Eliab is angry. David turns from Eliab. And here's why. David knew better to engage in that battle with his brother. He knew that if he engaged in that battle with his brother, then he was going to miss a bigger battle. He was going to miss a better battle because the battle that he was supposed to fight was going to change his destiny. The battle that David was going to engage in was going to change the destiny and the future of God's people. The battle that David was determined to get to in the middle would change his life, but also would be a part of God's purpose and God's plan. And he was able to be a part of that. You see, David recognized he wasn't there to fight his brother. It was about God's purpose. That's the reason in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said this. He said, our fight is not with people. That's what David knew. Our fight is not with people. It is against the leaders and the powers of the spirits of darkness in this world. It is against the demon world that works in the heavens. Listen to me very, very closely. Spiritual battles cannot be won with natural tools or instruments. Spiritual battles have to be won with spiritual weapons. That is a reason that when when you find yourself being distracted with anger and the temptation to respond and and to to get on Facebook or or whatever and just, just respond negatively to what other people are saying and doing, you have to fight that because you'll never win in that arena. You you have to determine that you are going to fight the fight of faith and you're going to fight this spiritual, that your battle is not with people. It's against the enemy. That's where the battle is at. You see, but the enemy loves it when we get distracted and start venting towards people. That's not where the fight is. David knew that and we do too, don't we? But we can stand and we can pray and we can believe God because it's in that arena that we win. It's in that arena that we overcome. It's in the middle and in that arena that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. 
There's another moment in the middle. There was Jesus and his disciples one day. Jesus uh, was going back to Jerusalem, and this would be his final trip to Jerusalem. So his disciples were, were going, going along, and what I mean by the final trip, he was going there for the last time because it was there that he would be crucified. It was in that season that he was going to, to die on the cross, and, and he realized that. He, he, he knew that. And so they're on their way and they're, 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 they're walking along and apparently they stopped and th there were two sons that came up to, to, to Jesus uh, kind, of, kind of, you know, over, over on the side. And maybe, they, maybe it went down this way. They, they were standing over to the side and they went, hey, Jesus, get, get, just come over here. Just come over here. <laughs> He's like, yeah, what, what's up, guys? What, 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 what do you need? James and John, the, the sons of thunder, they said, look, Jesus, listen. We, we really love you. We really love doing what we're doing, just being a part of this whole thing, but we, we need you to do a favor for us. And Jesus said, well, if, if I can, yeah, I'll just, you know, what is it? And they said, all right, we, we know you have predicted your death, and we know by what you're saying that it's, it's pretty close. So we're kind of thinking about the future and, and, and in the next kingdom, and would you do us a favor? Would you give us the privilege in the next kingdom, in the new one that you're coming to set up, the, the one life after this one, would you do us this favor? W would you allow one of us to be on your left side and one of us to be on your right? And Jesus was like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But I want you to watch what happened. Mark 10, 41 records it this way. When the other 10 followers heard this, they began to be why? There it is again. They got, they got angry with James and John. And here's the second point that I want you to realize tonight about anger. Anger divides. Anger will always separate. Anger will always divide. But I want you to look what Jesus did in Mark 10, uh, 42 and 43. Watch this very closely. Now get this. So if you have the two over here, <laughs> they've asked for the favor. You got the 10 over here, and they are ticked off. They're upset. So, so, so watch what Jesus did. Mark chapter 10, verse 40, uh, 42 through 43. It says, Jesus called them together. <laughs> so where was Jesus? If he called them where together, he must have been in the what? The middle. So, so they, they came together, and, and, and Jesus began to talk with them and speak into their hearts, speak into their life. He said, Jesus called them together, and he said, the other nations have rulers. And you know that those rulers love to show their power over people, and their, uh, and their important leaders love to use all their authority. But listen to verse 43. But it should not be that way among you. Whoever wants to become great among you must, to, must be willing to serve the rest like a servant. Now, 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 Jesus is talking to the individuals that he knows are going to be the foundation, if you will, of the New Testament of the church, the church he came to establish. He, they're the very ones that he prayed over and said, Father, I pray that they will be as one as, you, as me and you are, 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 are one. And that's the reason that Jesus wanted to help them understand something. That, 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 that Jesus believed and knew the power of unity. That's the reason that Jesus met them in the middle and he created unity because Jesus knew the danger of division. Now, let me just say this. The two brothers that they wanted privilege, that's what they wanted. They wanted something that the others didn't have. And Jesus said, no, it doesn't work that way. That's the way the world does it. That's not the way I do it. That's not the way we do it. He said, come together, guys. And, 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 and here, here, here is why he did that. Again, he understood the, 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 the dangers of division. He understood that. Listen, in a family, when there's division, it's dangerous. In, in the workplace, in a marriage, if there's division, it's dangerous. And in and, and a, and a church, in a, and a nation, if, there, if there's division, I'm telling you, it is dangerous. So Jesus was in the middle, and he brought them together. And he said, look, we're not here to focus on privilege. We're here to focus on purpose. And the purpose of you guys being together is to serve one another because you're better and you're stronger together. Listen. Jesus is still crying out for folks to, in marriages and families, places of worship and the nation going, come on, guys, 
I'm in the middle. Come to me and let's get together and let's create unity. Listen, unity is one of our values here at Life United. Unity is one of our values. This is what we believe about unity. Unity doesn't happen by accident. It is created. Can I have a better amen than that? Amen. Here's another thing about anger. Here's another thing about anger that's important to understand. Anger provides. Anger provides. You say, well, what does anger provide? Anger provides a door. <laughs> anger provides a door. Let me, let, me, let me remind you about two brothers. There are two brothers, uh, first two brothers recorded in the Bible, Cain and Abel is their name. And um, God is speaking with one of the brothers. His name was Cain. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 God's speaking again to Cain. Listen to, what, listen to what God is talking to Cain about. He said, uh, God asked Cain a question. He says, Cain, why are you angry? The Lord asked him. Why is your face so dark with rage? It can be bright with joy. We, we started off singing about joy tonight, right? He said, he said, it can be bright with joy if you will do what you should. But if you refuse to obey, now listen very closely. This is a beautiful, beautiful, we could spend a lot of time talking about this because this is part of God's mercy. He's giving Cain a heads up, right? Listen. He said, but if you refuse to obey, watch out. Because what, listen very closely. Because sin is waiting to attack you longing to destroy you. Again, anger, anger, anger will always provide something. And here's what anger will, anger will provide. Anger will provide a door for the enemy. Actually, in the Hebrews, you study this in the Hebrew, it, it, when he talks about sin is waiting for attack, to attack, actually, it, in the Hebrew, it paints a picture of sin standing on the side of a door, and so when you walk through the door, it gets you. So what, what, what God is saying to Cain is this. Cain, look, look, listen to me. Listen, anger is going to turn into sin. And if you don't watch it, it's going to get you. Listen to verse 7. It can be, excuse me, what happened there? Hold on a second. Oh, here, listen, it can be bright, uh, excuse me, it can be bright with you. It can be bright with joy uh, if you will do what you should. But if you refuse to obey, watch out. Sin is waiting to attack you, longing to destroy you. But listen to this. This is God speaking to Cain. But you can conquer it. What is he saying? Cain, listen, you're angry. But listen, it does not have to control you. It does not have to beat you. You can beat it, Cain. That's a word for somebody. Some people go, I just was born. I was born this way. I was born angry. No, you weren't. <laughs> you weren't. But if you are full of anger all the time, listen to me. You don't let it have to beat you. Because anger will always, anger will always provide a door. I like this quote. Anger is one letter short of danger. I like that. Anger is one letter short of danger. That's the reason Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, If you are angry, do not let it become sin. Get over your anger before the day is finished. Listen very closely. And do not let the devil start working in your life. Here's a couple things I need to remind you of about Satan. Number one is that he is real. <laughs> He's real. And, and we, we are crazy if we go through life pretending or believing that he's not real because he is real. The other thing about Satan that you need to remember, your enemy, the devil, Satan, is that he can't behave. He cannot behave. If he gets a foothold, if he gets entrance, if he gets a way in, he cannot behave. Something's going to get stolen. Something's going to get killed. Something's going to get destroyed. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. There's another middle a moment that I want to remind you of. Again, it's about Jesus in the middle. And it's not on a road. It's not by a lake or it's not in a house, but actually this time Jesus is in the middle, but he's on a hill. He's on a hill. And this moment that we're about to talk about, he predicted it. Jesus predicted it. Matter of fact, Jesus was not the only one that predicted it. There were prophets that for 
Hundreds and hundreds of years, there were prophets that were prophesying about this moment where Jesus was going to be in the middle. He, he, they, 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 Isaiah prophesied about it, and others prophesied about it. And then Jesus, when Jesus gathered his disciples, he told his disciples several times, and he spoke about, and he predicted this moment. Matter of fact, in John chapter 12, verse 32, is one of the times that he said it, and one of the times he predicted it. And in John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will attract people towards me. Now stop real quick. Get this image in your mind. Because it, it, you've probably already figured out what we're talking about here or what Jesus is talking about here. Because when Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, he was predicting his death. He was predicting being on the cross. You know, a lot of times we use that in praise and worship. We say, well, if we lift up the name of Jesus, we lift up Jesus, God will draw all men, or the Holy Spirit will draw all men, will draw people. And, and, and I understand where they're coming from, but that's not a praise and worship scripture. As a matter of fact, in verse 33, John said that uh, John uh, made it very clear as to what Jesus was talking about there when he talks about being lifted up from the earth. He, he said, this is the death. He was talking about the type of death that Jesus was to die. So he's talking about what? On that hill... On that cross, he's talking about his death is what he's talking about. He predicted it. Jesus again said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw people to me. I'm going to draw all men where to me. Jesus in the middle. Again, the, the title of this message is meet me in the middle. The fourth thing that I wanted to, to point out to you about anger is that anger has an antidote. <laughs> anger has an antidote. The, the definition of an antidote is a medicine taken to counteract a particular poison. <laughs> Do you know that anger is like a poison? Have you ever known people that were just angry? It's almost like they were born angry. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get permission from my brother to tell this so don't tell any don't tell him if you see him don't tell him that I told this but <laughs> I love him he's he, outside of my wife he's uh, Chris is my best friend he's a great pastor great man of God great husband great father but Chris used to be mean I mean Chris was like angry all the time I mean to fight man this guy would fight you could just look at him wrong and <laughs> it was on why because he was just angry all the time but there came a point where he discovered this antidote. He discovered this antidote. He discovered something that would counteract the, the poison of anger that had, had gotten into his life. Another, another definition, another way to say or, or describe antidote is something that counteracts or neutralizes an unpleasant feeling or situation. I love that. Something that counteracts or it neutralizes an unpleasant feeling or situation. Now, now I want you to step back to Cain now. Pause and step back to Cain. Do you know why Cain was so angry? Do you know why Cain was, was angry? Well, it says it right here. Well, I'm going to share that with you. Genesis chapter 4. Step it back just for a moment, then we're going to continue on. Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. It says, Abel, his brother, brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift. Verse 5 says, But he, God, did not accept Cain and his gift. Watch this. And this made Cain very angry. And he looked dejected. So get this in your heart. Get this in your mind. See this. So Abel brought the gift. It was the best portion of the firstborn of the lambs of his flock. You go back and study that. That's exactly what God asked for. The first portion, the very best, to be brought to him as an offering. If you go back and study it, you'll see that Cain didn't do that. That Cain, the way the Bible describes it, it was sort of like when he got around to it, then he just kind of brought some fruits and vegetables to God. And that's the reason that God didn't accept Cain and his gift. And again, this made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Listen, this is what I want you to get. 
Cain was rejected by God. It wasn't God's fault. It was Cain's fault. And here's the point that I want you to get. Rejection is painful. Rejection is extremely painful. And here, here's the thing about pain. If we don't catch pain and know what to do and understand the antidote for it, that pain can turn into anger. You see, a person that is not accepted is a hurt person. And a hurt person become, can become an angry person. I don't know about you, but I've never met anybody that would get up in the, in the morning and go, you know what, I just pray, I just hope that somebody just rejects me today, just will not accept me. I don't, nobody, nobody would think that way because rejection, it's painful, it hurts. And, and pain can turn into anger if we don't have the antidote. Now, let, let's step back into this point. Remember what Jesus is talking about, this moment that he predicted that he's going to be lifted up on the cross. And now we're just a few hours before he's actually going to be up on that cross. At this point, Jesus is beaten with rods. Over and over and over, he's beaten with rods. And it wasn't a private matter. It was very public. Before they began to beat him with rods, they stripped him of all of his clothes, and they, which was humiliating, especially in that culture. So they start beating him. While there, people around are just cheering it on and laughing and just having a party, having a great time, he's being beat and beat and beat and beat and beat, and beat spat upon, cursed at. They're not done yet. Then... They grab what they call the Roman soldiers, grab what they call the cat of nine tails. It's, it's a piece of wood. It's got some leather on it. And I'm not going to go into the, all of the description because it would take too long. But it basically it had metal woven into the le pieces of leather. And it had glass and pieces of things that were very, very sharp. And it was woven into all of that. And it was soaked in water. And again and again, they would hit and hit and hit and they hit Jesus. Say, man, that was, that was tough. Yeah, it was, it was tough. Not done, and they put a crown of thorns on his head and press it down. I want, you to, I want you to listen to this. He didn't say a word. The Bible doesn't record him saying a word when he was beaten. It didn't say that he said a word when he was hit with those rods, spat upon, cursed at, laughed at. Not a word. Not a word when they put the crown of thorns on his head. Not a word. It wasn't until he was lifted up, as he predicted. When Jesus hung on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, Jesus made seven statements. Five of the statements that he made, it just says that Jesus said. One of the things that he said was, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He just said it as he looks down from the cross. After spikes have been driven in his wrists and his feet. He didn't say a word when that happened. But once he is lifted up, he says, Father, forgive them. He even said, looked at his mom and said, Mom, there's somebody to take care of you. It's you to take care of my mom. It's honor. So five things he just said, but there were two things that he shouted. There are two statements that he shouted. He says he cried out. One of them is recorded in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. It says, and at three o'clock, Jesus shouted with a mighty voice in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. You know what that means? Again, he just didn't say it. He screamed it out. <laughs> you know why? Because that means, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? Now, again, he never screamed. He never said a word with all the physical pain. There was something that happened that he screamed because he felt a pain in his soul. It's when God pulled away from him. It's when God looked at him and said, you are no longer acceptable in my sight. 
listen, he screamed out because he felt the pain that every human is born with. Because every human is born separate from God. Everybody. That's the reason Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of the glorious standard. (laughs) In other words, nobody measures up. Because we've all fallen short. Why? Because that was the condition of every man. That was passed on to us from Adam and Eve. We were born separate from God. And we got this big hole in our soul. And I've been in a lot of different countries. I've lived in different cultures. And I've seen it everywhere. I've seen it everywhere. People are angry and they don't even know why. It's because they've been born separate from God. And they're, they're born with it, and so they don't know that it's not, it doesn't have to be that way. It's just normal for them. I've seen it in Romania. I've seen it in, in the UK. I've seen it in Europe. I've seen it in Central America. I've seen it just every place I've been. I've seen it in the U.S., different states we've lived in. I've seen it. Different cities we've lived in. I've seen it. Different cultures. I've seen it. And people are so angry. It's a global truth, and I've seen it everywhere. But when Jesus cried these words, if we could peel back that moment, if we could pull back the curtain and see what was happening behind the scenes and from God's point of view, you know what we would see? When Jesus cried out in pain, the pain that pierced his soul from being because he was separate from God, do you know what we would see, ladies and gentlemen? We would see God creating the antidote for our rejection and our pain and our anger. 2 Corinthians 5.21 does just that. It it peels it back and it opens it up and it shows us and it helps us see what was happening. It says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for sin, excuse me, be the offering for our sin. So, watch this next part. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is one of the most powerful truths in the Bible. It's one of the most powerful truths in the Bible. I could just put it in a nutshell by saying this. God's righteousness is the antidote for our rejection and pain and anger. In other words, it'll help anybody. That's the reason that Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Watch this in verse 17. For therein is therein, for in the gospel, the excuse me, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. Where is it revealed? It's revealed in the gospel, the good news. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what is God saying to us tonight? Maybe you're here tonight or maybe you're listening tonight and you, 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 your husband or your wife has told you, you know what, I'm pushing you away. Maybe a family member. Maybe it was someone that you loved, someone that you trusted. I'm, 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 just, I'm just pushing you away. You know what? That creates pain. It creates hurt. And it can turn into anger that can, can open the door for the enemy and come in and do horrific things in our life. But you know, the good news is this. The good news is this. Is that there are some that may reject you. There are some that may push you, that will push you away. But God will not. And what God is saying tonight is this, is that he's asking you to meet him in the middle. Meet him in the middle. Because that's where he's at. Put your faith in him. Put your trust in him. Because, you know, the the last thing that Jesus cried out, he didn't just say it, he cried out was this. He said, Father, commit my spirit into your hands. That was a statement of faith, a passionate cry of faith. And you can have that same kind of faith. And you may say tonight, you know, nobody knows how, nobody knows what it feels like to be pushed away. But let me say this maybe some people don't, but I know one person that does. It's Jesus. 
And that's the reason he's asking you to come to the middle and put your faith and your trust in what he did for you on the cross. And you know what happens? That antidote, that medicine, that, 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 that powerful substance that neutralizes pain, that begins to flood your soul. And freedom comes in and healing comes in. And it can happen if you'll just trust him. Meet him in the middle. Give him a shot. Give him a chance. He paid a great price. He was pushed away by God so that God could open his arms and accept you to himself. And when God accepts you to himself, there's healing that happens. There's restoration that takes place. There's joy that comes. There's peace that comes. God's asking you to meet him in the middle and trust him right now. <laughs> but wait, there's more. I'm just getting started. No, I'm really about done. Romans 15, 7 says this. Accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you. In order to bring praise to God. You know, in America, we're facing and we're working and walking through and dealing with some serious issues. And I would love to say that the world could get it right, and they're trying really hard. I would love to say that the government could get it right, but they're trying really hard. And I would love to say that, that, that the people, are work, they are working. They're working very, very hard. But you know what? They just don't have the tools to get it right. But you know who has the tools to get it right? We do the church, God's people. They can't get it right, but we can. The world can't get it right, but we are. We're the only chance that the world has to see God. And they can see it through us when we determine in our heart that we will accept each other just as Christ has accepted Thanks for connecting with us today on the podcast. And you know, we'd love to connect with you in person at one of our campuses in Shreveport, Louisiana, or in Lake Charles, Louisiana. You can get all the information from our website, lifeunited.church.